Hi, it's been a while. I hope you all had the best of summers here in Latvia. Here is the rest of the conversation we would have probably had with Klavs in Madonna a month ago or so. And here's the beginning of a new season here at the Kula podcast. I hope you all enjoy it. Welcome, Klavs. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Calling from uh, exactly from um, Yorkshire, right? England. That's right, Yorkshire, a little village called Hapworth near home for Huddersfield. <laughs> uh-huh, right. So we met. Uh, so you originally from, uh, you were born in Latvia. You grew up here for part of your life. And um, we met briefly. It was this summer. We had the chance to meet in Madwona, which is in eastern Latvia. And we had a brief conversation and uh, it was fun. And I said, why don't you come to the podcast so we can continue with it? Well, what happened is we decided we're going to do this big holiday. COVID was over. Well, it's not over, but, you know, we passed sort of thing. You can travel. And um, we decided we're going to drive to Latvia because we made a decision. We're not going to fly for a holiday. So only way to get to Latvia is driving. So we um, spent a week driving to Latvia, visiting other sites on the way. Uh, and when we got to Latvia, we had a week. And in that week, I had a very long list of things that I wanted to do. And I thought I will have plenty of time, but obviously it wasn't enough time. So by the end of that week, when I was, when we were supposed to, when we planned to go to Dogo Pills, me and Claire were so exhausted before, why are we going to a new place? Like we felt like, let's have a holiday, proper holiday mm-hmm. where we can be relaxed. So we ended up going to Riga because Riga for us is very simple, uh, familiar, I think that was the main thing, a familiar place where you can feel at home and you can get a beer that you yeah. can do, sort of thing. You know, I'm doing this podcast because yeah. my my idea is to, not being from Latvia and living in Latvia, my plan is to actually get to collect as much as I can from people that are from here to try to grasp some common way in which your 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 mind works. Yeah. It's a big generalization, but this is pretty much why I'm doing it as a foreigner that is curious of some similarities between between you guys. Yeah. And I was thinking when you come back to Latvia, how do you feel? It's a very difficult it's a very it is a very deep question and I think about this a lot. Um there's a I, f- I feel like my Latvian identity is sort of complex. Um and when I come back to Latvia, there is part of me that feels feel feels at home, and the same time not. Um, um, I feel at home with my family, but also sort of removed. It's very complicated. Um, I mean, I've been living in England since two thousand and four. Um, I came to England when I was fourteen, so um, I've been living in England for you know longer than I lived in Latvia. Um, so my sort of homecoming is sort of very strange sort of thing. And in the university, when I studied art, that was actually my main thing that I sort of was exploring. I know that you saw my degree short film and um, yeah, yeah. Where, where I came back to visit my uncle. Um, but it's difficult. I don't know. If, I don't know if that's a straight answer. Um, I do feel foreign in Latvia, um, but I don't feel uh, but I don't feel like that's a problem sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, what they usually say about Latin is they are quite um, uh, what's the word they are quite reserved and I am the opposite I mean I talk non-stop you know I like to go and say hi to people so that really alien- not alienates but uh, I stand out in Latvia especially in a small town like Madhuana if I am a loud man who just walks up to a person and tries to start a conversation in Madhuana they do look at you it's like what's wrong with you and for me I'm like I'm so excited to be back it's like I want to talk to my <laughs> fellow countryman and they're not that interested it's the same in Riga when I go into these cool bars and I was like oh it's such a cool bar and I'm trying to like have a like this meaningful conversation with someone behind the bar the person is very confused it's like why are you talking to me <laughs> you know do I know you and and then so, mm-hmm. so, so yeah, I don't know. I don't think that really answered anything. But <laughs> well, I, I have lived in Riga for four years, more or less, and I have met people that present a bit of an exception uh, from the 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 stereotypical reserved Latvian that you're addressing to. So, but yes, I mean, uh, generalizing, I definitely understand what you're saying. More introverted culture, and uh, you don't necessarily feel like that, but. So, but I've seen people that remind me of you, and there is one actually that uh, I interviewed, which is 
which is, a, I would like to call it a, a friend of mine, if not an acquaintance, uh, Jakobs Nimanis, which is a, a Latvian composer that uh, very extrovert and very uh, communicative and very much fun. And uh, I don't know if you know him, but there's a, some recording over there at the Kula podcast. Well, but the thing is, of course, clearly you cannot know everybody's like that. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm preaching to the choir, I think, if I say that. Uh, I was uh, I was I was that first wave of Latvians uh, leaving Latvia when we uh-huh. came part of the EU. My mom went. I lived in in um, in Latvia with my mother. I lived with my aunt for a year till my mom decided to take me to England. I didn't want to go to England. Like I was, I really wanted to stay in Latvia. So for me, it was quite traumatic to move to Latvia because I was a child with no. I had no saying. I, I was like, even though I spoke English at the time, because obviously in Latvia you learn English from very early, you know, it's years. I still didn't want to go. I was, you know, I it was a very stressful and traumatic experience for me. Um, so for me, when I always when I came back to Latvia, um, I always felt I always felt like I've been judged of, of, um, of, of, of idea of in Latvia what they uh, of people that live in England. So there was this always sense that that somehow life in England is so much better, but I didn't feel like that. I didn't want to be there. And everyone was telling me, oh, you're so lucky you are in England. And I was like, I don't feel lucky. I don't want to be here. All my friends are there. And I have to make new friends, new new culture, new everything. It was very stressful. So I didn't feel like that was this uh, advantage um, till maybe I was... I don't even think there is advantage now. I think I grew out of that. And now when I go back to Latvia, maybe that's why I don't feel... Like homecoming, I come there as a grown up with a very clear idea of what I want to do mm-hmm. uh, and where I belong. When I go back to Latvia, um, I still maybe have that sense of um, guilt that I left because uh, I, um, but I don't think I've ever have felt as a um, that there's advantage that I have that I'm here in England. Um, partly because I also, it's hard to say this, but partly maybe because I also don't see myself. Uh, fitting into Latvia, um, mm-hmm. I have I have now and then looked at what I would do if I would move to Latvia. What would what what where where would I work? What would be my what what you know where would I fit in? And and then and there are places, but I think they're quite niche. And mm-hmm. and and then and then because I've been so far away, so so long away from Latvia, I find it would be sort of difficult. So um, I don't think there's advantage, no. You've spoken about guilt. What do you mean by that? I think when I was a kid, I I really believed Latvia was a great place. I really believed that. I, I was very proud of being Latvian and, mm. and, and, and I wanted to stay in Latvia. And f- for leaving, I felt like I was abandoning my friends. From even from young age, I was, I, I felt like that. And then when I grew up, when I got older, I also felt maybe guilty that I'm actually when I was 18, I could have gone back. No one would have stopped me, stopped me, but I decided not to. As kids, we were not responsible of those big decisions. We still carry the guilt of uh, even if we haven't made those decisions. I understand what you mean. There is but... guilt also because I also felt um, now be more aware of the situation when my mom left. And, and there's nothing, there's no hard feelings for that. I understand why she did it. And I understand why a lot of people did it. But there is, um, 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 you know, I think the guilt is also partly that I have, have I have not returned yet because I understand of uh, the brain drain that happened. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of young people, a lot, lot, a lot of people just leaving Latvia. That's not good, you know. The, um, and I feel like, why didn't I go to university, do something really useful, and come back to Latvia to bring some sort of value back? But I didn't do that. I studied fine. So uh, <laughs> I. I uh... Sometimes, though, this is one of those, um, can we call it maybe a, I don't want to call it a cliche, because if I call it a cliche, I kind of charge it with negative uh, connotation, but pass me the term. Let's call it a cliche. Yeah. I heard very often, of course, in my country, too, if we talk about uh, the south of Italy, which I'm from, yeah. Yeah. Uh, people go away and then they're supposed to come back and uh, to to better the situation. Yeah. But I got the feeling that in the meantime, as the, the world changes more towards an idea of globalized Europe and things like that. So it seems that this cliche, which is useful, of course, mm. which I don't have anything against. At the same time, the, in the meantime, while we go away, the world is changing and we're losing the idea of nationality at the same yeah. time. So it feels that maybe 
the 14 years old clubs uh, with the memories of the uh, of the maybe the diners and the and the fall costumes and all those beautiful uh, ancient uh, yeah. symbols yeah. and everything. He was 14, and now you are in your 30s, like me, maybe I guess. No, yeah, 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 yeah. in your 30s, and, and 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 in the meantime, not only you have changed, not only you have left, but also the world is changing. So, the idea of nationality is, is probably um, um, uh, shifting a bit to. Yeah to a more globalized idea of you my brother despite where you come from somehow even if we should value the country where we come from as a reality that's supposed to grow it seems that uh, our heart is somewhere else in that sense we cannot commit that much we say more like Vienalga. Yeah. i'll contr- i'll contribute to whatever my new home is my new country and yeah. i'll oh no maybe I absolutely agree with that. I mean, what you said is exactly how it is, because what the world, the Latvia that I so much missed and I didn't want to leave doesn't exist anymore. I mean, Latvia is not like my wife. First time when I took her to Latvia was in 2014. Uh, 14? No, that's a lie. 2012 or 13. So almost 10 years ago. Um, From that first visit, to what Latvia is now, it's a different country. It, Latvia is changing so fast to good, uh, in, at least in my experience, from those small periods that I'm there. It's becoming truly European country. And I, this, especially this time when I was in Latvia, I was walking around and I was thinking like, this is, this could be any, none, this could be anywhere in Europe sounds uh, demeaning. That's not true, but it feels, it feels, it feels really um, like there are people that are really trying to make this as good as it can be, and it's and it's and then it feels like yeah, just because I didn't come back doesn't mean the country stops or or it stops developing. You know, it's still um, going forward. Um, and you're and already defending the apologies. You're already defending the the shield just by being uh, of Latvian origins and by being an, an artist already just by doing that. I would like for me, this was very strongly for me is I was born in 1991. Latvia became independent. 19. I mean, my, my birth certificate is still from Soviet Union. It says SSSR and it's all in Russia. Yeah. But in England, when I had to ba- open a bank account when I was 16, <laughs> they, they required my mom's passport <laughs> because, because of the surname. They were like, oh, you're going to have to bring this birth certificate as well. I said, it's in Russian. <laughs> and I gave it to them. It was quite funny. But yeah. because I am that generation born in 1991, you know this generation that are uh, that are 30 years old now. We are the young professionals, or maybe just professionals not now, rather than young now. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know I, that there is this sense that how much has been achieved and how much we can achieve. I think that's why that this sort of nationalism sounds very strong, but that's what it is. Um, but that's why I think in Latvia it's so um, sort of. That's why it's there, sort of thing, because the memories of, mm-hmm. you know, like recently, only only thirty years ago, we were independent, and how how fast things have changed is amazing. You know, my biggest my biggest thing that I was, um, if you're talking about what's happening around the corner, my biggest embarrassment and and realization was living so was um was was under under underestimating the aggressor next doors because mm-hmm. living so. Being so removed from everyday life in Latvia, I generally felt like how we, you know, what happened in nineties with with with, uh, with with like non citizens and everything. I was like, well, that's that was ridiculous. Why we did that? And I was like, it's not that bad. It's not that aggressive. And mm. I realized I was taking the a point of view of of British person, mm. a Latvian. And when things happened, I actually was in Finland. I was speak, speak, speaking to some Finnish friends and they were, they were sounding exactly how I, you know, how my, how my family in Latvia sounds like. And I realized that, that uh, it's very easy. It's very easy not to feel a threat when you are, you know, two and a half thousand miles away. But when the uh, when when the aggressor is next door, are you thinking totally differently because it's a real threat. While while I'm uh, while while I'm here in England, it feels more like a theoretical threat. So it doesn't feel it feels so much softer. It feels like oh, you you all were doing this. It's not that bad. And then obviously it happens, and you realize, well, I was the fool now. Uh, mm-hmm. But that was kind of interesting as well about this nationalism in Latvia. That I was like, yeah, it's. It, it sort of can, yeah. But actually, driving the whole uh, driving to Latvia, but like the eastern part of 
Poland going so, so through Slovakia um, straight and then going through Lithuania and going upwards. You do notice a little bit more military activities and maybe that was just in my mind, but being this close to Russia coming from England, I got, I, not that I got anxious, but you are more aware of things and then you realize that there is, I, I feel like there is a bit of fear. When I sp speak to my aunt, my aunt is now, I think in her fifties, late fifties, and she is quite frightful of what's happening. And you realize there is the sort of fear in, in a nation, which is totally understandable. And, and I think because of that, uh, you are, you will gloss over what happened, what America has done because, and, 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 and I think, and I think that's fine. I, I think that's absolutely fine because there is a bit of a crisis now, you know, uh, we are very tiny and I, I think um, challenging that is probably wouldn't be helpful because, because there is crisis and there's there's need for a sense of um, the life can be normal. That we're not going to get in the life of a sense of safety, I guess. And I think America brings that with NATO as much yes. as like that. I mean, I was when I was in Madhuwan, I was woken up at two o'clock at night by helicopters flying across, mm. uh, and I couldn't understand what it is. I, I went outside uh, in my underpants on the, on a balcony in this guest house I was staying and I couldn't see these I was like what is going on and, the, and there was it was a half an hour going backwards and forwards and and, and it was um, NATO doing training the trainings exactly. no, I felt, yeah but yeah, that, that made it feel really real like oh yeah shit is real you know my little cousin uh, wakes up at night and he thinks he's gonna get bombed he says so he says these things clearly I don't know where he heard it or anything but he puts those things together and things is it starting you know and and I think in that kind of environment, the fear obviously is there, even if you don't think about it. And then whoever is better, whoever, you know, yeah. It doesn't matter. It's also choosing between, choosing, it's like choosing politically. You have to choose, you know, you yeah. can't, you just have to choose. I think either you go with them or them. Latvia is too small to be someone like, uh, let's say like, like Sweden, that they can be very different politically. Latvia has to be, with with one superpower or with the other one because we are we are tiny i mean how about uh you you're an artist uh, i so you're well, a it's a hard thing to say you keep calling me an artist well i have to kind of come why are you so shy towards being called an artist because, why because i don't so for for quite some time i haven't been producing any work because i uh once once i left london uh in 2016 I think I had one more uh, exhibition in Leeds where I moved and then I ended up working for a large arts um, organization called Invisible Flock and I basically was uh, running their studio and then and then and then and then and, 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 and doing the fabrication and there was really fully involved and unless or more I have stopped producing work and I think that's maybe was partly because I found my place where I belong it to, to a certain extent because I think my like I mentioned previously my art was very much about my identity being Latvian in England and then and, and the, the stories mm -hmm. told and then and when, when I sort of reached that point I just felt I didn't know what to make you know I went in that artist slump where you just don't know what to make and and then and I ended up working for this organization that was um amazing experience uh but it was absolutely, you know, it, 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 it just, it, it was so involved. I was so involved that I haven't produced anything since 2016. So when you call me an artist, yeah. I just feel a bit uh, like yeah, I deserve that. Imposter, yeah. I guess. <laughs> but has they, uh, so they, uh, let's say, let's call it the inspiration mm -hmm. uh, behind the uh, clubs being the artist and, uh, and his personality as a Latvian in England, hasn't survived, but any craft has survived, like maybe video making or anything else, anything, any any skill that is still there and you are waiting for that moment to uh, put another inspiration at work. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, video work always is something that I, like, that I like and I enjoy. And I think there are times when I want to go back to it. Um, um, but it, it, it does feel a difficult sort of thing to do. Um, um and i think i'm fine with that I'm, I'm i'm sort of i think i'm fine with that i i am concentrating on other things to keep myself busy um 
I'm very hands involved anyway. I, I live on a farm now, so I'm always. Yeah, there. I do remember. What is it? What, what is your typical day? And my typical, uh, right now, because my life has massively changed ever since I came back. Uh, previously, cool. it's different, and now it's totally different again. Um, um, I like to totally change my uh, routine in my life every six years, I think. But typical day today is I would wake up um will because uh, i live on a farm it's a small farm uh mm -hmm. it's mostly a holiday business my fa wife's family's holiday business mm -hmm. i wake up and i'll we'll do uh, animal feeding with, nice with what the animals to stay we mm -hmm. got we got a bunch of we got some pigs we got some cows we got mm -hmm. some chickens in a weird way um so yeah so we do the animal feeding of of these animals and then um and then i do um bunch of stuff of fixing around the farm it's very much like living on a farm but what i was going to say is that that sort of uh, maybe so uh, my family has still has a farm uh, well it used to have a, a, a homestead we in certain near barca or madonna mm -hmm. um and i think why i feel so fitting here because this mm. sort of reminds me of my childhood when we had you know, when my aunt really wanted to be a farmer and she had these dreams and now I'm like, oh yeah, I can be the farmer. I can do the, um, you know, I can do my, I can have a little bit of pigs and all that stuff. It's it's very much just for, uh, um, uh, more for ourselves rather than for anything else. It, it's not how we make, you know, living. It's more mm. just the uh, fun. So it's a bit, it's a bit of, um, yeah, it's an interesting. It's almost like a, the right thing to do almost like meditation it makes you fit and healthy in your mind no that's discipline, exactly, that's discipline it, and nature that's exactly what it is i think what it, what it what it was i was working i was working very i was working very hard with the newsbook flock and it was exciting and i'm traveling the world uh, uh we went to you know uh, doing these shows that are that are really really you know important and great because we were um uh, an arts charity uh, they are still arts charity and then and then and then and, and, and our main work was about climate change so we would really uh everything we would do would, would be considered any any build we would do we would know where we're going to get the material from we know where the material is from um, and we know what the material is going to do and we will be we will be like all encompassing of like how we can make sure that we are as green as we can be and and we can make a change in the art because there's a I always felt there's a bit of a problem in art world, especially now. Mm -hmm. that, uh, if you are an artist, it's sort of it's okay if you use very, you know, if you use plastics uh, and you uh, throw away plastics or like microplastics, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you. That's okay because you're making art, and I feel like that's a very old um, um, uh, uh, idea in my mind. Oh, um, mm -hmm. there was a, a, um, on a way back from Latvia, we went to. Uh, um, Kaunas and Kaunas is the city of culture this year mm -hmm. and we saw a, a piece by um, I can't remember her name she was uh, with the Beatles there what was her name? Uh, Yoko Hono that's exactly so I saw, saw her exhibition uh, oh, yeah. and I really and it was and what it was it was about climate change it was uh, it was a room full with coffins and you had the tree growing out of it and it really upset me because though, because the idea might be great, but in reality, you're basically killing those trees. I know it sounds stupid. There's 30 trees, you know, you can grow more, but the whole point seems stupid. It, what, the, what, what it was, it was trees brought inside and they and the heat, the not enough light, not enough water and all of those aspects. Those trees, just well, most of them are wilted. And I'm looking through this and I was like, I am, uh, and I know what is... What I don't like is, um, so uh, I don't like the idea of uh, using plants um, as an aesthetic sort of mm -hmm. art decision choice because- like an hostage. Yeah, because because you, you will die. So, and if your work is anything to do about the, 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 the environment, the trees and everything, yeah. why do we still uh, um, create this work where, you know, human is the, uh, the main person, the main character sort of thing. We are the rulers of everything. Mm -hmm. We can take this tree and put it inside. It will die for this uh, this like three week long exhibition where you can explore, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, the climate changes and 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 and, and then all of that just makes me um, feel like we should look at it differently. You know, yeah. like if you, you want to make 
work about trees or plants why don't you make it in situ why don't you create people go to the actual where the trees are and, and I just think that we can be yeah. further on to that if we want yeah. to if we want to talk about those uh, problems there's an, another, another way of talking about it I just realized while I'm moaning about that my, my plant needs some water yeah, yeah go we do, we do it now that's totally fine so somehow you know somehow I realized that so you're continuing with the legacy of a farmstead and uh, a life in nature with a bit of discipline that belongs to the lifestyle or whatever. Sometimes the artwork is actually, I don't mean to sound a bit cheesy, but sometimes we leave the artwork. We don't have to make it. Sometimes we are just in this urban life uh, where we are far away from actually doing things ourselves or whatever. We can we can become the we can be part of a routine that has got so much practicality in it and so much um, and so few computers around that actually maybe someone feels like I don't need to do art anymore in this sense. I'm leaving something that is actually quite interesting and fun that like living in the, the countryside and I tried it in Latvia and I'm I haven't been bought in yet I still there are still many things that I need to do but I understand that there is so much to do and uh, there are so many satisfaction here and there in learning how to grow plants and maybe yeah. build it a, a a timber shack or things like that yeah. that is part of life I'm leaving something that is in, I'm also leaving something that is I'm not saying that is artistic but it's definitely so intense at the end of the day, I'm sleeping heavily because, you know, you sleep really heavily at the countryside. That's, and um, it's another way of doing art, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I always make, I always joke with my, uh, with, with Claire about that, uh, me being on a farm. I was that no, I always joke about that um, my farming is, uh, is my art practice. Yeah. Uh, my <laughs> farming is an art practice. And then, then, um, and it, it, it is, it, it is, I, I, what you said is, I absolutely, I totally, you know, um, that sounds exactly how I, I feel about it, is that just because I don't make art, it doesn't mean that I don't feel like the same, because I'm otherwise not, you would, otherwise you would, I, otherwise I would, exactly, I'm so involved in like, making stupid mistakes and my oats not growing, and I'm, I'm like, I do, I have a lot of small test patches where I'm trying to be I don't want to use any machinery, so I do everything by hand just to see how difficult it is. And I've been trying to grow out oats for the uh, last three years, owls, is, and it's been <laughs> it's, it's been a failure every year. But I keep going, and it sort of becomes this art practice in my mind that I, every year I'm going to try again and again and again. And that one year I will have enough oats to make a bowl of porridge. What well, please, 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 uh, uh, Klaus, for People like me that don't know shit about it, like simple enough. Tell us why it's difficult to grow oats. Well, first of all, I'm a bad farmer. Oh, so you got that in common. <laughs> no, um, it's not difficult to grow oats. Also supposed mm -hmm. to be very easy to grow, but I think the way how I've chosen to grow them makes it difficult because I don't want it to be easy. The reason uh -huh. why, um, why I keep failing is because I have a lot of wildlife. I have... Um, a very large uh, population of rabbits uh, that like to eat oats when they're on the floor, when you see them and you broadcast them. Mm -hmm. And I also have a very large population of rooks, um, birds, mm -hmm. um, that also, as soon as you plant it, they come and eat it. That's basically the main reason. Um, uh, but I am not particularly good at that. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to shoot them because it feels like I don't want to do that. Uh, I want to find a way of doing it and obviously the problem when it comes to it when i've done a lot of research some research i say i've done a lot of research I've done some research in this and the problem is that my design is too small so when you design a field to uh, to plant with oats let's say you need to take if you don't want to kill everyone around you all the animals you need to take into uh, account how many animals you have how many birds you have how many um, uh, rabbits you have and then you need to plant big enough field that they can take their share and you mm -hmm. still have yours, but uh, my fields are far too small because they're just a test field. So it's uh, uh, well. That's uh, okay. So there has to be some sort of big plan, and uh, for everything that at the same time you appreciate also as wildlife. So it's difficult yeah. to it's consider. Whole, I'm, I'm I'm very interested in the sort of holistic farming, um, and mm -hmm. that's why that's why I think it fits very well with uh, 
uh, farming as an art practice. Because mm-hmm. you think about all of these things, it's not so forward just to go in with a tractor, and turn everything over, and you don't care about. It. You just put more and more chemicals in, and nothing like that. I don't, I, I don't like that at all. But how do you feel in the from having this mindset of a farm uh, farmhouse uh, routine when you come when you go to London for a couple, of, if you still do, or if you go to a big city, or how do you feel? I feel it's it's great. Uh, the, yeah. It's amazing. London is the best place ever. I always think. Mm. I love London. Like um, the reason I moved to Lon- out of London was me and Claire were um, were about to get married, and Claire got a fully funded PhD in Huddersfield University. So she ended up moving up here, and I was living on my on Mon- in London on my own for a while. But um, for at that time, for five years, we had lived together in London and shared you know the cost of living in london and yeah. suddenly you are on your own trying to find somewhere to rent and i was like i don't want to i you know I, I know i couldn't commit for like a whole years of contracts so i was going from you know um uh, from from a sublet to sublet to some squat it was it yeah, was squat to squatting you know, it, well it wasn't a technically a real squad but it felt like it it was really crap <laughs> that's what you told that's what you told the police that night it wasn't really, <laughs> yeah. this is not really what, what you think it is <laughs> but it was it was really tough and london was really tough uh, and i was really afraid of moving out of london because when you i'm sure you know this when you live in london you can't imagine anything else happening outside, outside of london uh, at least i couldn't and i was really you know, people will tell me that I will go, I will go, I will move to Leeds. I will walk in in a pub, ask for a beer, and I get punched in the face because I got a funny accent. And it didn't happen. I had a great time in Leeds, um, but I enjoy going back to London now because because of that. When I go back, I can have the best parts of London, and I don't have to live there. You know, I don't have to commute. I know what to work on a busy train, even though I miss it because that's what I did my, all of my reading. Nothing can be better than sitting for an hour on a, on a train if you can have a seat or in a bus or, you know, I miss that. But now when I go back to London, uh, it is, uh, I do mean, I do really enjoy it. Um, I, I, it's very, I think it's very uh, exciting, very, uh, um, uh, you know, in, uh, inspiring place because yeah. it, even just like going to uh, going to um, shops, you know, going to like a um, uh, uh, you know like a like a liberties or so, just to walk mm. through it, you get so recharged of different um, designs. Mm. Yeah, and the amount that is available, your mind just start going, and and then you realize why London is so great. But when you live there, mm. if you live there for a while, um, you sort of start to hate it a little bit. But yeah, you 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 see when you live there. Somehow, at least me, at times it would appear pretentious a bit, all that much stuff. But yeah. but I understand, I feel exactly like you now. Now I can have the best of London because I can go there and I could have time there. I could go there on holiday now, but yeah. I didn't have the time to do anything. But one thing that I do remember is that when I was off, when I wasn't working, I would feel, an electri- I would feel some sort of electricity of being in the place and being in the moment um, that I... I had never felt before in my life. It was something I never had too much time dispo- for me or to go out or whatever. Or, but every time that I was off, because I was working very much, because in order to afford London, I had to work really a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. As you as you know, yeah. unless you're you very you're doing really well, you really feel the cost of life. And uh, I remember some like some shortage, or whatever, some nights. I felt I felt like I was in the in the in the belly button of the world like this is an yeah, italian yeah. translation maybe but a literal one i don't know but i felt like in the center i felt like there's so much of it after a couple of beers i also felt even more excited about it. I, yeah. I know i know what you mean by this elect- electrical feel because that's how i felt when i when you're in london you get drunk of other people's energy you know because they Everyone is walking fast. If you're not walking fast enough from London, you are clearly yeah. a tourist. And everyone is, you know, I was a person who couldn't stand slow walkers. I would even tell them to go, you know. But you get drunk of this energy that people have, and you realize that you 
you know, you can easily work, you know, far too many hours and you don't even, and you don't even clock that maybe I am working too much. Maybe I'm getting burnt out. Maybe I'm getting tired, but it's amazing. You fool with adrenaline, you go through it, but then you reach a certain point in your life and you feel like that must be more than just yeah. work, pub, yeah. work, pub, barely sleeping, you know, uh, and thinking, why am I tired? And why am I getting a little bit more miserable? So there's a, there's a London definitely feels, if you don't, yeah, exactly. If you're not, incredibly successful in london london is definitely for uh for when you are young yeah I, yeah i wouldn't want to be in london now because um no. i still would have to share a house with someone you know i couldn't have my own place and i, I couldn't have a car and i think uh -huh. that would be you know i would i'm sure i still would have had fun but um but it's not yeah but you you chose a different investment uh yeah. which is Definitely. Which is the, and also it kind of worked in my opinion, because I imagine this, imagine like doing what you like to do in a scenario like a farm where there is, a, you can, you can be in contact with nature and you got your routine, you got your satisfactions. Mm. It's hard work, but you probably don't feel the hard work anymore. You feel like this is what you want to do. And then all of a sudden taking the train to go to London feels almost like well, after you watch a movie, that, or maybe the other way around, you know, when you come out of the cinema, you get to reality and you have that kind of that, yeah, yeah, rush. Yeah, yeah. Usually not in a shopping mall. It's nicer when, in this, when it's in the city. But you get out in the street after a cinema, or maybe it's almost like getting to two different realities, but you're making the best of both. Because yeah. you're making the, but when you're in London, um, even with different amount of money in your pocket, I, I believe, you kind of you're in it and you're not able to see sometimes you get accustomed to it and uh, and me personally i was getting to the wrong side of it i was realizing the time here is running really fast mm. and it felt a bit like, like jurassic park yeah at the beginning it's a like, woo there's so many yeah yeah, yeah you yeah. know the dinosaurs that i've never seen and uh, this is like a dream about then uh, you know jurassic park doesn't really and yeah. yeah well and i realized that the years were running so fast and um, and somehow you retiring in a farm in a farm uh, and keep working at, at the same age we're just almost yeah. the same generation. For me, it was moving away from London and coming to Riga in advance, where the reality is definitely more calm. Yeah. And uh, and I feel early because I feel that uh, maybe some people make these decisions when they retire in life. I don't want to wait that long. I mean, I feel exactly the same. I don't want. Yeah. That was exactly the same thing. Uh, I think I didn't feel like that quite when I was in London. I still was a bit um, drunk on it. But when I moved to Leeds, I really felt like, um, I really felt like, well, like going from London to Leeds, Leeds is a great place. I really enjoy Leeds. Um, a really good time there. But in the same time, I was like, why am I here? Why am I in the city? I don't want to be in a city. All my weekends, I would come to the farm to see class parents and, you know, just go for a walk or whatever. And it's what you said is exactly how it is, is that now the, the work that I do doesn't feel like work because it's I do what I want. So, uh, um, and I do it when I want it because I live here. So it means that I can have a time off in a daytime to do something else. And you, re you realize you you totally, you, you look at life totally different mm -hmm. sort of way. Um, uh, um, and then it is sort of calm that makes me feel like you only can have, um, the other way, how if I if I wouldn't be here, the only way to have this kind of lifestyle, I almost felt like would be only in Latvia. Yes, in Latvia, the, uh, I this is it's hard to these things like what I what I, how I feel about Latvia. I don't know if it's true because uh, I haven't lived there. I don't know if that's true, but how I how I see it makes me feel like that in Latvia you can have quite slow paced life. Yeah, still have you know amazing beaches. Uh, yeah. You know, you still have a countryside house because you know almost everyone does, um, and then everyone is a little bit more relaxed, a little bit almost looking more after themselves mm. in a sort of way. Even if it is just going to your grandma's um, house to pick some, you know, berries, uh, apples, yeah. berries, exactly. Mm. Well, in London, you don't do that. You don't do those things. You don't have time. You don't have time. You do twelve hours every day. Um, yeah. uh, and then then you might go home uh, or you go to pub you get uh, you know to drink you get wasted food. yeah yeah uh, you know <laughs> when, I, when I was in straight after university I, I worked as I was a manager in a 
this weird place called it was like a deli cafe it was an absolute mess i shouldn't have been a manager what, what was the name i my what was it the was, name it was called east side deli it was in oh. shoreditch um, oh nice very quite hip. Was, yeah it was i don't know how i managed to do that I, I didn't want to do it but i did it for the money and i would do you know 10 to 12 hours every day and then Wow. I, I would then travel um, to my studio, which was in um, uh, Wembley. So, <laughs> wow. was, oh my goodness, the other way. Because I was 23. I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine, it's fine. And I will get to my studio, don't do any work, drink loads of beer, and then spend an hour and a half to get home. I'm at home by 11, you know, by 12 o'clock, I'm in bed, and then at, at six o'clock, you are up, and then you do that again. And I did that for half a year, and then I was like, "This is this, this is just stupid. It's not good for anything." Um, and I, then, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. But like, I, you were twenty three. I was twenty six. I did it a bit later than you. Yeah, and and I'm older than you too. So um, I did it later than you. And I remember I was so for me it was Queensway. So on top of Hyde Park, the first job. And I was living in uh, in Whitechapel, so I don't know if it's, but it's kind of far, a bit yeah. far. With, with the tube, it doesn't feel that far. Yeah. And I had this room; I could afford this room in Whitechapel, which wasn't really safe. The area there was as big; it looked like a monk cell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was really like a corridor because they, you know, they were cutting out rooms out of everywhere, pretty much. So, and I remember in those days. But it was my space. So I was living alone for the first time in my life. So yeah. for me, it meant everything. And uh, and so I was getting stuff from the street, like pieces of furniture, yeah, to cram yeah. in the room where there was no space at all, but just to create this weird and perverted coziness where I, I selected something from the street and now it's here with me and there was no space to move around. Yeah, And for me, that was actually some sort of, Something natural that happens to you when you want independence and you want to live in the most exciting city in the world and you try to build a bit of home around or whatever. Yeah. But um, but I, that was us like uh, some time ago. And I think that we, if we hadn't been there, we wouldn't have been able to make the, I mean, the, the right the, decision, right? The, 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 the furniture from the street. I mean, who has it? Like, I, I still have a table. I don't know, maybe I gave it away, but I still have a table that I picked up from a street in outside of London. Actually, it was actually um, Claire's, uh, Claire lived in Whitechapel as well, actually. Uh -huh. um, and in this house as well, that house was also a bit questionable. Um, mm. um, but there was a lot of strip clubs around. And I don't know if it was from a strip club, but there was a table once outside of a strip club, like two o'clock at night. And be like, this is a good table. So yeah. we took it in. And that table is still somewhere. I think it might be in my mom's house in a garage or something. But uh, but it was it, but like when you mentioned that, it, I think it's part of being also in London. It's really mm. about, you know, you, you take what's available around you because there's so many things. Yeah. Yeah. But if we ever, if me and you, we hadn't been in that moment of 23 and 25 of feeling excited in London and then probably eventually feeling a bit like the consequences of growing up in it, yeah. which is not natural, I believe, the fact of spending too much time in there, we wouldn't be here now. And I think yours is some, some sort of con weird continuation of your roots because, you it, know, you it, moved away from Latvia 14, you experienced the metropolis and then you ended up in... Something that, as you said, is a is a life at the countryside. You know, like yeah, you know. It, it is. It's. I think I don't know what it is. It's. It's sort of. I think it's. You're quite right. I think you know. Well, um, because my life as a child is very similar of my life now. Not that I'm a child, but like environment is very similar. Um, and I think I made that. I made that decision. I could have stayed uh, with Invisible Flock, uh, and I could have done exciting work abroad and everything it would be really great but i didn't want that i wanted to be here and i don't know if that's if that's sort of the trauma of leaving latvia and still living in this dream world of what that place is or, or maybe i'm building my own um it's sort of hard to tell but um yeah but also we like the the I don't want to call it corporate jobs, but the normal hierarchy of life and career, I'm not saying there's, not, there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes there is so much in your head being in that uh, environment that you forget the beauty of a free evening on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. or on a waste day, which is invaluable. There is not enough money to buy that somehow. Yeah. So if you if you're happy enough with the way that you, in my opinion, that you provide for a place, and there are many ways of being paid, which don't necessarily have to do with yeah. money, in my opinion, but you have it makes sense in your life. I think you you you're laughing already. You're happy because there are a lot of people that. There are a lot of people that are hungry for careers and they're, they're wired in a way that they can be in a stressful environment uh, more than me, definitely. And uh, they're, they're made like that. Yeah. Um, but I, for me, life is more about me not, worried about, not being worried about work. Work is just a way for me to, to, to pay for my bills. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. and just grant me some time off for 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 podcasting for reading or whatever yeah. uh, of course i'm working and i'm going to be very busy but at least i don't have the stress of the pressure of the hierarchy and i'm trusted and uh and there is not enough money in my opinion to be in that position i mean it's not it's not you cannot monetize the pleasure of not having to deal with stress at work <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think that was, um, but you know, you, you're talking about uh, there's no better feeling of having a free evening on Tuesday. Um, right now, the position I am in, uh, I don't really have any free evenings <laughs> because I am in a position where I I do exactly what I want to do. And, and on a the farm, there's always something to do, but that's absolutely yeah. fine because it's, it's you so- like it. I like it exactly. It's so different. And um, I we used to use Slack for work. And Slack is excellent, but Slack is the worst software ever. It's like a like a team software where you have multiple oh, yeah. channels for projects and so on. But it would be non-stop off. I would go on holiday uh, for two weeks, let's say, and it would take me five days not to feel anxious or picking up my phone to, to not to see message. And then when when three days in my holiday, I wouldn't receive any message. I would think something's gone massively wrong. It's like, why aren't they talking to me? Even though I am on a holiday, they're not supposed to talk to me. And then you realize that's not good. Why am I like, um, why am I wired in this sort of way? Why do I think I have to constantly work uh, yeah. during my holidays? And and then, and, and, and then, yeah. And yeah, I sort of made the decision that I'm going to be, um, yeah, I mean, and like if I, I think you made if you're happy, I think you made the best decision. And also, we are in the information era now. We don't have to be, for example, study. We don't have to study academically something or sacrifice our life to a topic to to get to know a bit of everything. So there are so many uh, things around us that can get our attention. Like for example, now. You can get interested in the type of pest that you have around your, yeah, which yeah. probably really interested yeah. in those. And you you can dedicate the whole evening to read literature literature about it or finding out or maybe try to cook some sort of vegetable. And knowledge is so much available to you right now that free time becomes so important and so valuable. Yeah. When we were younger, there was an encyclopedia, and I. I needed my brother to reach the book and give it to me. And there were two images, whatever. Now, free time with all this information around, uh, all these things that are interesting and not sectorial or not uh, exclusive for people that can afford it. It just, uh, it looks like the best way to live in that sense. I mean, I think, I think the best tool um, you can have is YouTube. I mean, like whatever you want to do, you want to know how to, um, um, chop a tree down you want to know yeah. how to master your wall you want to know how to code something youtube and and it's a kind of amazing to think because that's what i've been doing i am sort of person who um i will say yes to anything uh because i like a challenge and then i will figure it out uh, and that's how i work i have that's how i always have worked is i like the challenge i like to new learn new things um and then but youtube is being youtube yeah. It's just some dude tells you exactly how to do things, and you're like, "There you go, I'm ready. I can do this." And you used to do art, and then, without meaning to be to sound cocky and uh, whatever or sound silly, you become the artwork. You, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you do in the, in the sense. I know it sounds like 
it sounds a bit like pretentious it's, or whatever. Yes, but... This is all just one perform bit long. But this is an uh, endurance performance. Uh, for, for yeah, I know, but like <laughs> you, you so much into that life that you don't need to represent it. You got you live in it, and also I remember I, I saw that video, and also what a coincidence that the the artwork that I seen that it was the video of uh, your countryside in Latvia. It became not the same, but it became somewhat your life. So. <laughs> So maybe yeah. there is a, a a link between those things that uh, the inspiration of representing the life in Latvia is over as an artist, uh, probably because you you got back living it. You are living the the thing. So there's no need. It's not necessary to represent it anymore. I guess. I think you are. That I think that's what it kind of comes to it. I think that. Um... That period in my life uh, was very difficult in university uh, because it was it was what it was. So it was very difficult. My position in it was very difficult as a Latvian as well. I was an immigrant when you when you um, and because I was a child uh, living in England as an immigrant, I had to go to school. Mm -hmm. So um, I would be always thrown in together with other Latvians, and I would never find quite. Um, things in common with them. So we always feel a little bit out of place because yeah. we tend to stick together when immigrant parties, that the ones that they know they're going to go back, they stick together and they don't really integrate. I think there's a lot to do, a lot of commu uh, immigrant communities do that and Latvians do that as well, obviously. And I always knew I'm not, never going to go back, even though I was maybe saying that I would, I know I wouldn't. So I made um, uh, friends from England and everywhere very quickly. So, but when I went to university, I felt very lost of my own identity. I think coming to, you know, becoming an adult, proper adult, living on your own, I was very confused who I was because even though well, maybe I felt quite, at that point, I felt quite English because I've been through school and everything. I really wasn't. I was very foreign, but then I didn't feel foreign because, um, you know, your partner, Anna, was on my course. And then I was like, the difference I felt was massive between um her being on the course and she comes from latvia um, uh, on her choice and me being the immigrant being mm -hmm. on the same course i see so what you mean i always felt like that was something sort of quite interesting that those two worlds uh you know in a weird way i always would be like she's a proper latvian uh, because mm. she's latvian latvian while i'm i'm sort of like some uh, uh, some crossbreed crossbreed exactly <laughs> and like, deluded because i've been here so long and and it was difficult because like, I didn't know what I want to do. It's like, what am I supposed to do? And I ended up making work about um, about myself, I guess. Like, I made work about myself. And then and, and, and that's why... And I think I felt quite lonely at those times as well because mm. I felt like no one was sharing those emotions, which is not true. A lot of people do. But when you don't talk about it, you feel mm. like you're on your own. I constantly was retrieving in my imaginarily beautiful countryside in Latvia so I ended up making this film and the film obviously was called Home Looks Very Far Away Now it's, but it's just because it's a, it's a sentence that my um, uncle says but it also felt like exactly what it was because uh, um, the film was the film ran in a loop um, and the idea was that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to visit my family and oh how they're gonna miss me and stuff like that but I turned there and life just moves on. It's always the same circle. Like you, just because you're not in that, um, in because you just not because because you're not there doesn't mean anything stops. And I was supposed to be, I don't know, the the, the character that goes back. But yeah, because yeah. the film is a loop. It never really goes anywhere. It's always yeah. the same. I always come back and and feeling kind of sort of happy and all that. But uh, yeah. and I think once once that was done. I knew that if that's over, like I can't really do that anymore. And, and you kind of you kind of tied it up. It was like it, it just it just was a circle. It was over. Yeah, and know? I think that's, that's it, but it didn't feel. It felt like it could never be over when you were in it. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. But I feel like that was also the end of my sort of. I feel like the main reason I went to uh, um, Goldsmiths was because of maybe. Because my work up to then was all about my identity. I used to, before I went to Goldsmiths in my college, I made, <laughs> I wish I had some to show you. I made these massive prints of myself, which sounds ridiculous, but I was trying to, 
Um, this is me being 17 or so, making these uh, full-size prints of myself, uh, representing what a typical Eastern European uh, um, is supposed to look like from English perspective, because I felt <laughs> I always uh, always have to defend myself and so on. I made these. I like it because it's got the irony in it. I like yeah. the irony in it. Like this. Okay, everybody's. This is how it looks. That's it. Like massive. How big were they? These prints. I think they were full size. They were full size of me, but they were, uh, but I made so many of them that I remember that my college because uh, it was free to print in my college. Do screen wow. prints. Wow! Uh, in London, me they started charging people because I. Uh. I, I made them like 30, thirty-five prints of myself. So. You change, uh, you change the the habits and the, all the services available in Gold in uh, Goldsmith or Saint Martin's Goldsmith. That was no, yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't do the prints in Goldsmiths. I did only, I only did prints in my previous college in Bedford. Um, ah, and I say, fuck this guy. We can't get a free one anymore. <laughs> because, <laughs> all right, um, okay, my friend. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you, but I hope you're gonna be. I don't know. You're gonna be in Latvia this uh, this year. Maybe we can go for a beer some sometime. Maybe not this year, but probably sometime next year. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm still I'm still hoping that one day I'm gonna be able to come to uh, to Gulben to see the countryside house. That's what well, I like. Well, you you're invited as soon as uh, they you know the people that they're in it are uh, they they consider that is livable enough. Your video uh, is the video of the artwork that you made is available on YouTube. It's on Vimeo. I can give you a link if you. Oh, want. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in the notes in the show notes. Absolutely, and yeah. um and thank you very much. So I'll uh, hopefully I'm gonna we're gonna talk soon. You're always invited. Absolutely, great. Ciao. All right, bye.